Okay, so um, Pastor Charles Mahadeo Singh has said before, uh, I'm a certified beekeeper and I've done beekeeping for a long time, maybe 15 years or, or more. While I was at seminary, I leased the apri that they had and I ran the seminary apri in Trinidad. Uh, for a long time, the seminary was Caribbean Union College at the time, and it's now University of the Southern Caribbean, which back then was an extension campus of Andrews University. So today, I hope that we are going to have fun as we get into the whole logistics of beekeeping. And uh, so G Gr Elder Graham said he has some bees. And I know Brother God ha Gordon has some bees as well. Is there any other bona fide beekeepers here? You have bees? How many highs? Just started. Okay, then, so then we can pray. Let's pray. <laughs> Let's pray. Okay. Gracious Father, it's such an honor and a privilege to be here to share with your people all the knowledge and wisdom you have given me to deal with these very, very interesting creatures, bees, honeybees, which scientists are still considering to be one of the most interesting studies. I do ask now as we spend some time getting knowledge as to how we manage the bees, we will grow to appreciate our wonderful Creator and Lord. And so now we ask that you would continue to bless us and with your presence. In Jesus' name, Amen. Now, there are four areas we've been looking at, and they are going to overlap from time to time. They may not come in direct order. However, the four areas we'll be looking at today is hive management, pest management, honey collection, and winter survival. Is that okay? I, I like to talk to my audience. If you all don't talk to me, I'm going to shut down. So you all got to keep responding to me. Is that okay? Yes. All right. So let's go. Um, now, Sister Gabrielle is f facilitating me with this. Uh, I just used, okay, I'll use this. Okay, all right? Right. So, this is the honeybee as we know it to be. And this is just a diagram of the external structure of the honeybee. Now, we know what, we know what this is, right? Now, I believe that if one angry bee comes into this room here, everybody will leave this tent. Who agree with me? Yes, yes, you will leave. If, 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 if that bee, unless you're a beekeeper, right? If that bee begins to tap you, just like that. It's not stinging you, it's just doing like that. And buzzing by your ears, you will run. Ah, uh, so... This is the sting, and I, and I don't want to go through all of the anatomy of the bees, but I've got to fast forward a bit because of the interest of time. So that is what the bee looks like. So we have the thorax, we have the abdomen, uh, the thorax is the middle, we have the head, and we have, you know, the antennas and the, the antenna cleaner, which are these here. We have... It's tongue, jaw, a creature. It's a full insect, and it's very interesting. So let's look a little 
So the body of the honeybee is divided into three sections, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. Each section serves its own purpose and supports the function of the body parts, its support. So the head has eyes. How many eyes does the bee head have? Two? No. It has more than two eyes. You'll discover. Right, the head has eyes, more than two. It has antenna, mandibles, the thorax is the middle, it is base is the base for the legs and the wings. Now it's very important as we do hive management that we learn a little about the bee itself and the structure of the bee. It's very important. So um it is and and the abdomen contains the stinger, the wax glands, and the reproductive organs because the wax comes from the bee. Uh, there are a lot of other things that the bee does. Actually, when you, when you drink honey, the honey has to be processed by the bee first, right? So the bee has this extra stomach to store the honey, and then it regurgitates the honey into the cell. Very interesting. Each part makes up the honeybee's exoskeletal, all of which are converted in a stiff fuzz of hair. So the bee is totally covered with hair, aiding the bee in gathering pollen and regulates the bee's body temperature. So we know without the bees there will be no or very little what? Pollination, right? Now, I'm sorry that we don't get a book. But this is the honeybee, and if you look at the honeybee carefully, you realize it has an eye on the top, like a third eye, right up there. Do you see that? Yes, yeah, so, so let's move on. I need to move on. Right, the two antennae on the heads of the, of the honeybee form a sensory powerhouse, providing a function f for a bee's sense. So one of the things you would you would learn about bees is that bees can also hear. Scientists did not thought that they can hear, but through the many ears that they have on, on their bodies and so forth, bees can hear. So the sensory power providing a function for a bee's sense of touch, smell, taste, and even a unique form of hearing. Right? That is what the antennas work for as well as long as the as well as the hair. It helps them to hear. Males usually have 13 segments and females have 12. In both cases, that's on the antenna. There are 13 segments on the antenna, right? Males have 13 and the females has 12. Each compartment has its function. Both case, there is an elbow-like joint. So I want to skip some of these things here now because what, what I considered doing for this uh, presentation is that if you all can give Sister Gabriella uh, your email and you all will get the presentation so because we don't have paper and so forth and anything that I skip you all will be uh, able to to get so honeybees possess two sets of eyes how many eyes two sets of eyes compound on simple the large eyes you can see when looking at a honeybee are compound eyes each compound eye is built with numerous eye units these units take in a separate image and transfer the information and so forth this type of vision allows the bees to navigate process information faster and protect their eyes from harm harshness of daylight. So God designed the bees in such a way so that the bees can be protected from the rays because their eyes are so large and so powerful. Each compound eye is built with numerous eye units. These units take in a separate image and transfer the information to the brain. So each unit of the compound eye takes in 
It's separate information. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine one eye is taking in one set of information and you can be looking that way and taking in one set of information and processing it at the same time? And another eye is focused that way and taking in another set of information and processing it at the same time? So God made the bee in a marvelous, marvelous way. Now, let's move on. Mm. The simple eyes. The three simple eyes of the honeybee have a single lens, but it sees in UV light. The UV light allows it to see the location of pollen, dark spots, so they know where to land. In conjunction with the compound eyes, the bee's UV polarized vision is the perfect tool for location for food sources. Ah, mandibles. And as I said, you can get the lecture. I will just skip some of these things and move on. And move on. Move. Okay, I want to deal a little about this here. Can you see this? What is this? Wow. It's pollen, right? No, it's, it's pollen. The bees has pollen. The way how its legs are designed is to collect pollen. So the, 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 honeybee, the honeybee has three pairs of legs, which sp spilt into six segments, making them very flexible. The front legs are specially designed to clean the antenna, while the rear legs have a section devoted to pollen accumulation called a pollen basket. Each leg has claws for gripping and sticky pads that assist the bee in landing on slick surfaces. Bees also have taste receptors on the tips of their legs. Let me repeat that. Bees have taste receptors on the tips of their legs. The bee uses it f its forwardmost legs to clean its antenna, and the middle legs help with pollen collection. The worker, has, the worker bee has a different set of back legs than the other bees in the hive, containing special combs and pollen press. So the worker bee is designed different from the drone, is designed different from the queen bee. Okay, so I need to move on again here. Let's talk a little about the reproductive organs. So we are going to get in a little while. Everything is going to tie in together and you will see why I'm taking this route to explain a little about the bees because the bee actually what it does and the work it does the, the truth is the body is designed to work in a specific way and how important is it 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 will help us if we understand how the body of the bee is designed and how the bee functions then it would enable us to better be able so it will better be able to take care of bees because while bees appear to be very tough they are very delicate creatures as well. Are we together? Okay. So, in, in queen bees, the abdomen features the spermatica, which is used to store sperm collected during her mating flights when laying used periodically as she fertilizes eggs. The ovaries of the queen will mature and begin producing eggs between the age of one to two weeks and will continue to lay eggs until her death. So the ovaries of the queen will mature and begin producing eggs between the age of one to two weeks. Does anybody know how long it takes for a queen to develop? From the stage of an egg to... No, no, no. Worker bees takes 21 days, three weeks. 
So, no, no, no. Queen bees takes a much shorter time. Two weeks, ten days. So queen bees, and, and, and so if you, if you understand the development of, of, of a bee, so as you look at the structure, just imagine that bee developing in ten days. And that is because that is how potent the, the, the pollen and the nectar mixed together at right proportions is. Are we together? So that they, they feed the bee royal jelly. And so th that's what the, the, the bees, the queen bees are fed royal jelly by the worker bees. However, the worker bees are not fed royal jelly. They are, they are fed uh, a mixture of nectar and pollen, but it is not as potent. And so what you have is that worker bees are really bees that do not have fully developed functioning ovaries. Are we together? But worker bees are really females. Who are the, who are the, the males? The drones, those big fat guys, and they don't, they don't last very long, eh? Now, on the side of the drone, I need just to move on here. So, on worker bees, there are four pairs of wax producing scale, scales exists on the underside of the ab abdomen. These secret liquefied wax. So, the worker bee is designed to produce wax. The worker bees is designed to fly for many miles. The worker bees is designed to collect honey. The worker bees is designed to guard the hives. The worker bees is designed to attend and to take care of the queen. So, so the task of creating wax within a hive is, is one left to whom? To younger worker bees. So the young worker bees job, from the time a, a, a bee is born, it begins to work. Isn't that interesting? The first job of the bee, as it is born, it is to clean the, 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 the cell that it was in. And it takes all the, the, the extra wax and stuff, and they carry it and they throw it out of the hive. So from the time a worker bee is born, and they clean the cells again, what are they cleaning the cells for? They are cleaning the cells for the queen to lay her eggs because the queen is a egg machine. Egg laying machine. She lays up to 5,000 eggs per day. She can lay eggs by the thousands per day so that the hive is, is a place where there is lots and lots of activities taking place consistently. Okay, consistently. And so, sh could you imagine her laying all these eggs every day? Okay. So, um, so here we see the task of creating wax within the hive, and workers can create around eight, around eight scales in a 12-hour period. Around 1,000 such scales must be created within the colony to make a single gram of wax. In other words, it's a lot of work for bees to make wax. And uh, the wax we enjoy with candles and other stuff and cosmetics, you know, your lips, oops, I, we, we, we don't use that, right? Oh, lip balm. Oh, lip balm, lip balm. <laughs> okay, so some of these I can move on, move on. Okay, so here we are. Uh, uh. Go back. So, mm, the picture, it's not too very clear. Uh, but basically, these are, what you see here is, uh, what is this beautiful creature here? It's the queen. She's a little larger than all the 
the, the worker bees. And what you see here is that the queen is always attended by a large number of uh, worker bees at all times. They take care of her, make sure she's comfortable, make sure she's laying, make sure she doesn't have any need. Isn't that the way God takes care of us? Huh? Don't think that they don't get angry with the queen too. she got to keep laying, you know. If she's not laying enough eggs, that can create problems. So this is the worker bees. One of the things about the worker bees is that they store honey, right? Now, so Gordon has a box here. There are a few things I would want to see. See, can you see this box? So this is a super, and it's supposed to have 10 frames in it, right, Gordon? It has 10 frames in it. And so could you imagine those little bees making cell, all these cells, each one filling them, working over time to fill up these cells to a certain height, not just the brood, but they have to do that for the super boxes. So bees, in other words, work very, very, very hard. And so because they work that hard, their lifespan is not very, very long. They can last about a year, maybe two, about a year. Bees, sometimes less than that. Right? So what I want to say is that for me, since we are looking at managing the hive, right? That's what we are doing here now. For me, this landing board can be at least an inch longer. Are we together? And the reason is, these bees, they come flying from sometimes four miles, two miles, three miles, loaded with honey. And we know that honey, nectar, as it were, sorry, not honey, nectar, as it were, is very heavy, right? It's very viscous and it's very heavy. Therefore, when you, if you don't have the right length, fair length of landing board, sometimes they misjudge. And where will they land? So I went recently to Tennessee and... Uh, one of my family member, he had a hive. And uh, the way how he had his hive, firstly, he did not have it very high from the ground. Now, how I was taught in beekeeping is that it's very important to have your hive a little, at least mm, two to three feet off the ground. I notice they don't practice that here. And so it prevents, it causes the hive to become less susceptible to, be, to being attacked by mites, ants, and other creature and the like. Now, what he did is that he had grass in front his hive. Maybe he think it was shading the bees or whatever, or it was just... But the grass affected the bees because they have been traveling for a mile, two miles with their little wings that you saw. Okay? And they are filled, loaded with honey, now, with, with nectar, and they are, I would believe, anxious to land, right? To get this nectar in there, in, in the cells. And so... The bees, and I was just observing them. And another thing is, he had, his landing board came like this, and then part of it was tilted like this. So the bees are landing right here, and just skating off. And they are hurting themselves. Bees are very delicate creatures. They only appear to be tough because they can run into you with force and sting you, but, but they are very... So that, so that the truth is, you need another... This is about what? This is about two inches. 
Yeah? So you need another inch at least on this here for the bees on your landing board. So this is called your landing board in front here, right? So if you are wearing bees, you need at least another to help your bees land safely so that they can um, last longer. So that's, that's one of the things that we need to keep in mind. You know, the, we, oh, and just before, you, you, bees are very clean creatures, right? Yeah. yeah. What you would notice is that when you, how would you know that a hive is working a lot and it's strong? You would see that they, 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 they drag all sorts of stuff from the hive and throw it out of the, the bottom board, some of them, and, and they will throw it on the bottom, uh, uh, sorry, your landing board, and they will keep here very clean, extremely clean, right? So, and sometimes you will see them throwing out ants and other wax moths and different things, so, you, so, so bees take very good care of their home, so that just keep in mind this, because what happened really around the hive should always be very clean. No grass, please. I don't know what you were told, but no grass. They harbor other insects, they harbor other things, and the bees like it to be clean. So at least mm, two or three feet away, if you want to have maybe four feet away, you know, you can have a little shrub, it's okay. But around, at least two feet clearance, right around your hive should be very clean. It helps the bees, and the bees love that. I'm moving on now. So, you can tell whether your bees are getting nectar from a very far place or a very close place based on uh, the honeybee dance. You know, I'm sure most of you have heard that the honeybee does a dance as well. You know, many creatures do dances. Well, the honeybee as well does a dance. And it does a dance for a number of reasons. So let's, let me just read. It has the, the round dance where it just goes around in a circle into a figure eight, goes around in a circle into a figure eight, right? The round dance, it goes around right into a figure eight, it goes around into a figure eight. That's just going around. It's not doing any wagging that is called a wrong dance. So the honeybee dance will be wrong if the food source is what? Close to the nest or hive. Interestingly, the closer the source of the food, the more cyc cycles performed. In other words, if the food source, the forage is where, where, where the food is, when they are foraging, it's, if it's close, then you'll find that the bees are in and out of the hive very often, right? That's another way you can tell. If you find that the, when the bees leave, you've got to observe your bees, right? It's very important sometimes to just stay one place and observe how they are coming and going, the rate at which, and so forth. You can learn a lot from that. As I observed what was happening to the gentleman B, sometimes you learn a lot from that. So, so when the distance is further away, more than 80 miles away, sorry, meters away, she will add tail wags to the distance. So the tail wagging dance or waggle dance, the diagram below shows how the dance work. The tail wagging forming the center of a figure eight type series of movement. So what the bee will do in this tail wagging basically is that it, when it does the figure eight, when it comes to this point here, it will wag its tail from side to side as it goes across. So the, the, the waggle dance is really a round dance with tail wagging in the middle. The further away the food source, the more waggles. 
So sometimes the bee will waggle a little. And if you observe that your bee is waggling a lot, you know that that bee is getting food for her, you know, is foraging for a far distance, maybe two miles, three miles, four miles, as it were. It's food is coming from a, a far distance. So you, you have to pay more attention to the bees because of the distance. And then you will have to now make sure that your queen is producing enough and is laying enough eggs, there is enough honey supply, there is enough uh, pollen supply, because the bees are working extra hard, okay? The bees are working extra hard. Now, I just want to give some quick facts for you to know. The queen honeybee is about twice the length of a worker bee, which you know. A honeybee queen may lay at least a thousand eggs per day, as she establishes her colony. Once honeybee eggs hatch into worker larva, they will be fed around 1,300 times per day. So why is this information important? So let me translate. You know why the bees sting a lot? It's because you are disturbing them. They are very busy creatures. So if they have to be fed 1,300 times per day while they are about, and you are coming and you are, and you are, you know, you are disrupting them, right? So when you are taking care of, of bees, when you, when you are going to take care of bees, you must have a smoker, and we would get to some of those things. But you have to be very gentle. Bees are very delicate creatures. Okay? So you don't want to crush them. You know, just move through your hive and crush them. You got to be gentle. Just gentle. Just take your time. And be gentle with them when you, when you are entering into a hive to check a hive. You just got to be very gentle all the time. And you'll realize that your bees will be sweethearts. They would not give you any much trouble at all. Now, foraging bees have to fly about 55,000 miles to produce a pond of honey. Visiting around 2 million flowers. So... Bees are overworked. Are, are, we getting, are we getting that picture? We love, we love the honey, but bees work very hard to produce that honey. And then we come to take that honey, right? So, so we have to understand, if bees are working that hard, they are very fragile, right? It means that, you know, they have to be fed. Okay? And in whatever way, like what I told you just now about the bottom board and having a proper landing board length and so forth, that is why it's, it's very important. We have to help them in whatever way we can. Honeybees are generally taught not to be doorstep foragers. In other words, they fly further afield to find food. They may typically fly between one to six kilometers on a foraging trip, but also up to 13.5 kilometers. I have seen it stated that 20, ki 20 kilometers has also been recorded, but have not been located this research paper. Oh, uh, forget that. Let's, <laughs> let's move on. Uh, okay. Each honeybee makes about one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey. Could you imagine that? <laughs> In its lifetime. Fine. <laughs> the honeybee is the only insect that produces a food eaten by man. Worldwide, there are ten different types of honeybees and one hybrid, the Africanized bees. How many of you have heard about the Africanized bees? Well, that is the bees that I had and that I looked after while I was in Trinidad. And they are extremely aggressive. I've gotten so many strings from them that I sort of became immune to a lot of things. 
And when they sting me, you know, it's just a, a tap. Okay? But these are the bees that sting very hot. But they will produce a tremendous amount of honey. And they are very strong. They keep their hive clean. They are, so they are very strong bees. They will throw out wasps. They will throw out whatever. Right? Honeybees are believed to be descendants of the wasps. And what have you? We can skip some of those. Uh, honeybee activity is dependent on temperature. It's dependent on what? Temperature. And you're going to hear a little about that a later on. Brother God will talk to it. Now there is some Brother Gordon. Now there is something as I, I, I don't know, but the, the practice I met in Tennessee, I I don't know if they practice it here. I haven't had the privilege to, to visit an ap- apiary here. But what the, the guy had in Tennessee basically is this is considered to be this very thin piece of plastic is considered to be a bottom board. Right? And so it's one. They pull mites out of them. Mm-hmm. Here. Okay. You do not need to leave You know, I spent about four hours helping that guy because when I helped him, he had one hive and his father-in-law had a couple. So when the father-in-law saw what I was doing, he asked me to come across by his hives. And so I was going. I do not know why there is a setup like this. This, I don't know who invented it, I know it can become very humid, right? But bees have a way of keeping the hive cool by using their wings. This is not helping or aiding a bees. Bees. This is allowing mites and other creatures to get into the hive. So... I do not support this. Because in Trinidad it's very hot too. And this is flush. This is flush. This is flush. Like, yes, I know. But what I'm saying this is flush is that this bottom board is flush. There is no meshing or anything like that so that it helps the bees to manage the hive and prevent mites. Because what they were saying to me, um, call me Charles, they said he, his hive is fested with mites, and mites is a big problem. Well, if you have something like this, mites must be a big problem. So this doesn't help the situation. This invites other creatures to come into your hive. And um, so... This here is, and so his bees now, what, what, when, because of this setup, what happened is that the bees weren't working properly because you know some days it's cold, right? Some mornings it's cold, right? And so for some reason the bees wasn't filling up and the queen wasn't really laying very well here. So he was really destroying his hive. I, I, and so what happened is that when I went into his hive, he did not have what is something that is called a queen excluder. I'm going to show you it a little later on to prevent the queen from coming up. It's supposed to have another box here for just honey. They call it a, a super. And so what happened is that the bees were coming up here and the queen itself was coming to the other level to lay eggs and so forth. And these brood box were designed for her to lay so your hive can become strong. So that this practice I do not agree to and the, the problem that I saw at, in Tennessee, I was able to help him to change that and he told me his hives are doing well, extremely well. 
presently. So, and the other thing is, so if you, you are going to buy a, a brood box or you're going to buy a box with honey and it has that slant, slightly tilted, uh, slightly tilted uh, landing board, I would, I would encourage you to just cut it off. Because it's affecting your bees. They, they land on it and just would fall right off your, you are lessening your hive, making it weaker. So you don't need this for temperature. The bees can take care of it, temperature, and keep the hives cool. You know, there are some places where there are bush fires and different things that pass through uh, different areas, and the hives were, pre were, were, were preserved. And the honeybees stayed alive because they can fan until thy kingdom come. They can fan and fan with their little wings. And when all of them begin to fan, they keep the hive cool. So I don't subscribe to that. Is that okay? Uh-huh. <laughs> so, so bees have been around for a long time. Um... This is interesting. In, in, 19, in 1791, during the French Revolution, the government demanded a record of all hives. Honey was used as a source of tax revenue. And you know, <laughs> as we come down to end, the end of time, I wonder if we would have to live off of milk and honey. Yes, yes. Because it's very nutritious, right? It, honey is very nutritious. Okay? And it has a lot of minerals, minerals which is necessary for your body. And where is Sister? Okay, she's not here. But if she begins to tell you some things about minerals, we need minerals in our bodies. A lot of diseases are caused because of mineral deficiencies. Am I speaking truth? Yes, with honey, bee pollen, royal jelly, lots of minerals. And the way these bees work continuously says that they have to be eaten well. Huh? The nutrition that they receive with whatever they are using is very good, healthy. So, I want to talk a little now about swarming bees and what it is all about and why do we do it. Am I, am I, do you all want a break? Am I boring you all? Okay. So, I want to talk a little about swarming bees and what it's all about. Now, bees swarm for some of these reasons. The other, so I have three here. Lack of space, right? Lack of food. And lack of smelling the queen pheromone. Also, diseases can cause uh, bees to swarm. And if the queen dies, bees can swarm as, as well. And now, let's deal with... Did I? Okay. So I have to... I have to... I have to just regurgitate everything now. Okay, for lack of space. So if you just have this brood box, and you have just one super on it, now, which is a box half, almost mm, three quarter, three quarter, about this, yeah, this is about four, four inches, five inches, it's a smaller box in terms of Depth, but it's the same width. Um, so if you just have this brood box and a super, and it's foraging season, the winter is over, spring, lots of flowers, and this hive begin to get congested because now the queen is laying a lot of eggs. What will happen is that the bees, because of much space, they don't have much space, a couple of things happen. When, when the hive become crowded, some of the, the bees 
will not be able to smell the queen's pheromone and so they will think that the queen has left the hive. And so what will happen is that they will swarm. Right? Um, if the bees if the bees are not being fed well, if there isn't sufficient food where they are, they can swarm. Right? And we talk about smelling the pheromone. So you may say, what is pheromone? The, the queen gives out a specific scent that attracts the bees and keeps them close to her. Right? And so the bees are familiar with the scent. And once they do not have the scent, her being the leader of the pack, as it were, they are going to leave the hive. Are we okay so far? Now, I just want to stick a pin. I just want to say something here. Now, we talked about the queen laying, right? And she lays a lot of eggs per day. Now, when it's coming to fall, when the, the foraging season is closing, when it's coming to fall time, the, the, the queen lessens the amount of laying. So if she was laying 2,000 eggs, she may now lay 1,000 or 500 eggs. What is this saying? This is saying now, and because of food being becoming an issue, you know, you know the drones, they just do one thing, they lying around with the queen, but so they get rid of them. The, the worker bees can get rid of them, which they do. They, 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 they push, actually push them out of the hive, push them on the landing board, and then throw them off, right? And then the drones die. But what happens with the worker bees now? She will begin to lay less eggs because the winter is coming, she, the, the honey season is finished, or foraging season is finished, she would begin to lay less eggs. So if she's laying less eggs, what is happening? Your hive is becoming what? Stronger? Your hive is becoming what? Weaker, Weaker right? So, and that is where G Gordon will come in. He will deal with winter. But this is why sometimes you can lose your hives for the winter. So sometimes, if you notice that your hive is becoming weaker, it's coming to fall, you need to keep checking your bees, what you need to do then, you can block off part of the landing board and leave a smaller place, space so that they can manage what, who comes in and out of the hive very easily. And because it's fewer bees, you know, there will be less heat per se. So that blocking off will also help with that. And so when food becomes an issue during the winter, you may have to feed your bees. And I would want to say concerning this, please, I want practice and I cannot teach you to, to practice feeding your bees sugar it is not good for the bees to be fed on sugar because wherever they go they will go for the sugar and it affects the quality of honey do you know that Trinidad is known for one of the best honeys in the world when we have, when, when, when they, normally they have symposiums where they, they go around testing honeys to find out which country has the best honey in the world, and Trinidad has been one of them. So take my advice don't feed your bees sugar, it's not nectar. Are we together? Okay, so that um, what, what you should do is that when you, when you, extract your honey and you should extract your honey right and this comes in now to honey collection you should extract your honey now when you are extracting your honey you should leave back always some and it's very important to extract the honey to keep the bees working and it and it will cause your hives to become stronger within the 
foraging season, you should at least extract your honey at least once. Don't say, I'm feeling sorry for the bees. I'm not going to take the honey. It's, it's, it's very good to take the honey at least once every season. Extract the honey from the hive. Is that okay? Right. So that, yes, so, so when you, so it's okay to feed the bees, but what should you feed the bees? What does the bees feed on? Nectar. But what can you feed the bees? Honey, right? Honey is just the same nectar with less water in it, right? Okay? Less water in it. It's the same, same, same nectar, right? So, and some other things would be saliva and what have you, but basically... Feeds, keep some honey to feed your bees for the winter. Now, we don't have winter in Trinidad, but we have the wet season. And during the wet season, a lot of bees die because, as I said, bees are very delicate. Just look at their wings. If a raindrop hit a bee, it will damage its wing and so forth. So, we too have to feed our bees during the wet season, but what you should use for feeding your bees is nectar. Now, so, so how honey is from the bees will collect the sweet nectar from flowers within a radius of four miles, and this nectar will then be taken to the hive. The bees have glands which secrete an enzyme. When the bees collect the nectar, it is then mixed with the enzymes in the bee's mouth, back to the beehives or nests. The nectar is dropped into the honeycomb, and there, these are hexagonal shaped cells, which in the wild, the bees make themselves out of wax and so forth. Right? The bees then use their wings and fan the honey to get rid of the water content. After some time, however, the water content is reduced to around 17%. This process aided by the bees themselves fanning their wings, which helps the water to evaporate from the nectar, from the nectar to form honey. So once the nectar solution has become thicker or more viscous, at this point, the bees will cap the cells. The bees will do what? Cap the cells. So you, you are seeing that, right? In other words, they, they will produce, they will take wax and seal off the honey cells, which means adding a layer of wax over, right? Below is an image of the Honeycomb, the bee have capped with a wax. So this here, I believe, is a bee knife, and here is a beekeeper. He's extracting, and so normally you can have a sharp knife that cuts, or you can have a knife that heats, has an element in it, whatever. You have an extractor, you can extract your honey but at least do once for the season. Now, I'm sorry that you can't see. In, I, I want to shift to now inspecting the hive. Let's do a little about of inspection now. And so I was looking for different clips that I can show what healthy a healthy queen will do. What a healthy queen will do, so what you see here is the larva at different stages. Uh, if you look closely here, you will see that, that this is a working queen. This is a queen that is doing well. She is laying eggs. These are one-day-old eggs. So when you go into your hive, you don't have to wonder whether your queen has left or not. From the time you see that there are one-day-old eggs and you have to inspect that, the hive. And how you inspect for one-day-old eggs, as it were, you, you got to 
if you don't tilt, you have to tilt the frame so that the sunlight can get into the cells to see the, these eggs here because they are very, very fine and you may not see them. But once you see them, you know you have a queen. And once you see a lot of those and they normally lay their eggs, you, mo you normally find the one day eggs more to the bottom here, right? You know she's doing well. And then when you, this is what you are expect, uh, inspecting for, starting from the brood box. You are looking at your queen. So how she's laying. So you not only want to see one day old eggs, but you want to see one week old larvas, right? You want to see them developing at the different stages, right? And then you also want to see them capped, capped off as well. So they are fed and they are bought, right? And then you will also see some who are breaking through the cells, young workers coming out there. So when you, so up, up on top, this part, so you have, it's a pattern, it's a pattern. You, you would see a lot of eggs here, normally, and then you're going to see like the different stages, and up this way you're going to see that it's capped off, and then you're going to see some honey to feed the worker bees, and you will see pollen as well to the side. So when you see pollen and you see uh, honey and you see those bee, those larva and eggs and pupa at different stages, you know your, and this frame is filled with that on both sides, you know that your queen is working well. She's working well. She's working well. And she's doing well. Now, before I forget, let me just stick a pin here. How often should you change your queen? How long does a queen live for? Huh? Oh my. I think we need to pray again. Oh no, we need to pray. Please. <laughs> a queen basically will last two healthy years. For the reasonably. So the truth is, part of taking care of your hive is continuously after a certain time switching around your queen, getting rid of the older one. After one year, three years, the queen is old. Right? Because it's a lot of egg she lays. Right? So that what happens is that what you will notice is that the bees themselves will start to look for a new queen. Oftentimes, once her, her, her lane started to go down. So that is something you have to look for. So I would recommend that after two years, Brother Graham, you should get a new queen if you want a, to maintain a healthy hive so that you don't lose them for winter and so forth. You would want to have a queen every two years at least. Every two years, if three, you can call it a three year if you want, but every two years because the more the queen lay, the stronger the hive remains, right? And new queens perform. They perform. Okay, right. And so, let's keep that in mind. Uh -huh. So these are just some of the equipments. Now, when I was in Tennessee, I have to just refer to ten in Tennessee. I can't go way back in Trinidad. That is a lot of drama there. So let's stick to Tennessee. Um, this here is your smoker, and this is your veil that you put on your head. Um, you cannot do that with Africanized bees, no matter what they tell you. Don't think you can. Don't wear gloves or don't wear proper protective gear. You have to. And don't think that you can go in an Africanized <laughs> hive and don't use a smoker. So what happened is that in Tennessee, the, the, his bees were large, and I know that they weren't Africanized bees. I think they were Italian bees, and, um, which are very docile, and they produce lots of honey too. Very good bees. Good for management, right? Susceptible to diseases, but good for management, for, for honey, and to manage easily. Now, I was not using the smoker, and I asked him to use the smoker while I attend to the, bee, to the bees. And, you know, he was smoking, and I noticed the bees weren't calming down. 
So I realized he did not know how to use the smoker. So properly, that is. So I have to take the smoker for, from him and demonstrate, well, use the smoker actually. So when you are smoking your hives, what you have to understand about this smoker is that this smoker has fire in it and it's very hot. So when you make a puff, you can burn your bees and litter. So you don't take your smoker and put it, this tip where the smoke comes out here, you don't take your smoker and put it in your hive like this. You're aggravating your bees and you're killing your bees. And smoke, because you, you just put your finger and make a puff and you'll feel the heat, right? So, so while I'm on the smoker, so, okay, let me just finish one thing first. Right, so that when you're using the smoker, so I took the smoker and I gave two puffs and all the bees got quiet. And they went into the hive. And he was like, wow. It's a miracle. He said, that never happened to me. Never happened to my father-in-law. Well, what is this? I said, so it's how you smoke. So how you would smoke your, your hive that you are going to attend to. Firstly, you smoke around. Right? I don't have a smoker. As yet, maybe. You smoke around the hive, you know, and you give a little puff inside. From the time you puff inside, if you listen, you'll hear, zzz, they are fanning the smoke out immediately. So you're keeping them busy, right? They don't have much time with you. So you, you give a little puff, not to stick it in because, as again, it, it hurts the bees, and you puff, you know, a little inside here. And so when you come this way, if you want your bees to go down, and anybody, you, just if you have a hive, go and try it. If you want your bees to, to get inside, go down, and not be around on top here, and you want the, 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 the bees to go down into the brood of itself, or into the super in between the frames, what you do, you just smoke across. How you smoke? Across. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have a smoker. Well, let's see. This is my smoker, yeah. And I'm holding it right. I'm smoking across. Okay? I'm not smoking this way. I'm smoking across. If you want to tilt it a little, but if you smoke across, you'll see the bees going down. If you smoke like this, you'll see the bees coming up because they are aggressive. You are disturbing them. You are burning them. And they are getting ready to attack you. Okay? So always wear your protective gear as a novice, beekeeper. Please, you don't want to become discouraged too early. <laughs> I've known a lot of people who went in and could not handle the bees properly and they had to get out of it. I've had the experience where I, this gentleman had his hives, never attended to them for maybe a year and asked me to go and extract honey and he got one sting. Just one. And he, he fainted twice. Wow. Yeah. The second time he fell and hit his head and I was scared. Because this guy was allergic to bees. So if you are getting into beekeeping, this, maybe make sure you are not allergic to bees because one thing can kill you. If you are allergic to bees, one bee sting if you are not, if you are alone by yourself, can kill you. <laughs> <laughs> so, be, so this is just the way you should dress for uh, taking care of the bees. You see the guys in his regalia. You now, I've seen a lot of people get a lot of things because of the fact that. You know, make sure when you are buying clothes to, to take care of your hive that it's spacey, right? It must be flowing. It must not be clingy. I've seen guys bent over and they got stung in their gluteus, gluteus maximus. I've seen it. Yeah, I'm, I'm telling you, I've seen it. Anywhere that is tight against your skin, the bees nose. And that is where they will attack you. So that... When you're taking care of bees, bees things, people don't like it. 
you got to be careful of what you are doing. As I said, a, a beast thing can kill you. Make sure you know better and make sure that you have clothes that are not clingy to you when you are tending to bees, okay? So get the proper gears necessary for taking care of them. Okay, so um, so th that's the glove, other things. Now I want to move on to this. This here is a, these are two very important beehive tools. This is the brush and this is the actual bee knife which you use to pry your boxes and so forth. Um, maybe I can get some pictures, pass it on to Sister Gabriella to show you how to do that. Um, I want to say something about this brush. Back to Tennessee again. So I, I was attending to the bees, but I did not have a brush. So I asked the, my, my cousin for his brush, the bee brush that you use. And now he brought a, thank you, Sister Jackie. He, he brought a bee brush for me. And I was wondering what he, in the world, maybe it was some brush to comb your hair or something. The brush was hard. It was, it was a bit brittle. Bee brushes should be very soft. Remember soft. Remember I soft. Remember I said that bees are very delicate? So he was destroying his hive, but at the end of the first winter he lost one. And we were in foraging season, and the bees still weren't doing too well because of all the other things I mentioned before. Right? Because they are delicate creatures. You have to know to take care of them and you'll do well. So your, the brush that you use must be like feather. Like feathers. This one looks very nice. You can tell it's very soft. You can just easily brush the bees. Where you don't, you don't, whoever sold him that, I don't know, but you don't have brushes that are. Now, this part of the tool is used for taking care of the frame. You can do a number of things. I see on this frame, they use a staple gun. But normally, when you are wiring frames, you can wire frames. I noticed that they don't use wire here. You can do this too. But normally, when they sometimes combs that they get heavy with honey, sometimes it tilts and what have you. But I guess they maybe have improved on this one. Um, normally, it is used. We use nails, and this part of the hive tool is to pry nails, to get rid of nails. You can take out nails and repair your frames and so forth with that. So it's just a little different setting here, but it's all good. Uh, maybe if you... So these are some of the tools that they, that they use. Uh, this tool here is for when you are using wire frames. You see, this doesn't have any wire, and they made it a, a little brittle. Sometimes when it's too brittle, one of the problems with if your comb is too brittle, I, 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 I don't think, maybe not, I, I'm not sure, but what I remember is that if your frame is too brittle, sometimes the bees will chew up the, the work sheet. And they will give a lot of trouble to form the cells. Right? So the texture of your worksheet is also very, very important. And so, so sometimes it's better that the worksheet is a little soft. And because it's soft, number, normally we'll have wires running through them. Right? And there's a way that you will put this down on a board and you will weave your frame through the wires. And then you use this tool here, right, which is an embedder, and you roll it along the wire to, to make the uh, worksheet be firm and will stay in place. Uh, we talked about the brush. This tool here, my, my cousin in Tennessee, he had this tool and I'm saying like, what in the world is this? 
He's, well, it's obvious. You can tell what they use that for. You use that to clip. You know, but it's, it's, I don't recommend it. Sorry. I don't. Maybe I'm a dinosaur, but I think you use with your gloves when you use your hands. The hive tool, this part of the hive tool here, you hook your frames on one side like this, you can hook and have your thumb, you can hold and attend to your bees that way and, it's, and I think you get better results and, and bees don't like too much of foreign stuff neither, right? So this is the super that I was telling you about. I want to talk a little about the super and some of the problems I encountered with a guy, with my cousin in Tennessee. One of the things is that, as I told you, the bees were coming up and a lot of his, some of his friends, the bees were not building the cells. Instead, they went and built their own, um, their own amount of, their own uh, honeycomb for themselves because his hive was weak and he had space, so they went and built their own. And so if you have your hive and you are having problems with the bees not uh, building up the wax cells, normally if you have that is because the hive is a bit weak. What you have to do is bees normally like to build from the inside. So you take off your frames, you take off your frames, and you leave a few frames, four or five frames, in the middle. Where? Eh? And the bees will build. So I called him a few weeks after. He says, oh, the bees are doing wonderful. <laughs> the bees are doing great. Oh, they are doing excellent. So that, and they were growing in strength. So now he's asking me, so now that they are filling bees here now, how, what do I do? Do I put more frames? Yes. But what you do, you, you don't, you add about two or three frames, but you have to put the frames where? In the middle. Somebody said to the side? No, the, the bees like to work right here. I, I'm, that's just from my experience, what I was taught, and what I see works best when I was into beekeeping. So, and eventually you just keep doing that. You, and you just add a, a frame or two, but you put them more to the middle, and you keep doing that until your hive is filled. So, when the super is filled with honey, what you have to do is sometimes you have to switch around things. Like if you have two supers like that on top of this box, uh, if they come to the top and it's filled, you have to switch it around. And normally, if, if, if they fill on to the, the second super, the third box, you have to switch it around. And then, if you have a couple of boxes like that, you extract your honey. Is that okay? Yeah. So, you know, there is so super, super. I want to get into some other. So, this is. That's just a complete hive with super and brood box and so forth. Uh, I like this for uh, taking care of your bees. If you can have one of this to rest your frames while you attend, you just need to move one frame out of your box like this for space. So you check each one, and when you finish, you can just shift them this way. Check shift this way. So you don't need to move a whole lot of frames to really start to, to check your hive. Aha. Uh -huh. Did somebody miss that I said what you check for in the brood? Did you miss that? Okay, what you check for and, and I went through, you want to see eggs here and you want to see a one week old larva, two weeks old larva, you want to see some seal brood, you want to see pollen up in the corners, mainly they have a pattern, right? And you want to see honey as well. 
that's how you check and once you see one day old larva you know you have your queen or one day old eggs right through across the bottom of the of the brood frame you know that you are in good business your queen is doing well aha uh -huh. so let's continue here this is a queen excluder what was interesting my cousin had no queen excluder i do not know what he was doing a queen extruder is very important for keeping the queen in the brood box and for helping her to stay focused on laying eggs another reason why you want your queen in the brood box because not every time you go into your hive you have to go down into your brood box is that okay you don't and so and the other thing is that how often do you check your hive no no remember they are busy creatures so you you, you don't have to check them often right eight times for the year not, not not bad more 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 like at least once a month kind of thing well well uh, during the winter is a different story so i i see i i see where you're going winter is different right so okay um i'm almost through so yeah so it's very important to have a queen excluder if you want a healthy hive uh this is what i was talking about you see the wire system and this is how you put your your work sheet sometimes you interwove it and you put it and you take the embedder and you roll it on i like this type of frames because the bees work with it very well because the wax itself it's a little softer. Have you ever noticed that bees that make its own comb, like sometimes if you have a space and it makes its own honeycomb, it's soft, it's a have a different texture? Well, right. That, that's one of the reasons when the wax is a little lighter, they work better. These are some... Uh-huh. Am I going too fast or too slow? Huh? <laughs> Okay, right. So, the other interesting things. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what they do here, but this cover is what you cover your box with. But he did not have a cover, an inner cover. This inner cover is very important, the way it is shaped. It helps the bees to come on top here and manage you know, manage around the hive to make sure and seal off this cover. Now it's very important the bees produce what we know to be propolis and um, that propolis is used to, to, to block any holes, any cracks and it will seal off this cover completely and so you, whenever you have a, a cover, in a cover you want to make sure that it has a space so it must be like half an inch deep or something so that the bees can come in that area to make sure the policing the area to make sure from pests and whatever and they seal and stuff like that so okay um i will have to skip some things this is this is uh gordon's section he's going to deal with uh insulation and stuff for the winter but this is what a brood box look like when you want to uh, multiply your hives you normally have a brood box but as i said before i don't agree and i don't support feeding your bees sugar right so i don't believe in that so one of the things and you'll get information on it uh, is if you want to split your hive, so you want to grow your apiary from one hive to two hives, you normally will split it. There's a way to do that. We we'll talk about that maybe another time, or I would send added information. You give Sister Gabrielle your email, and we'll get it to you. But um, when you are splitting your hives, you have to make sure that your 
the hive you are splitting from is very strong, okay? And when you are splitting your hive, I, you split maybe at the middle of the season. Don't split coming to the close of it or what have you. You will end up losing most of the time your hive altogether. So, these are some of the things I was talking about that you look for. Uh, you will see honey, you will see pollen, you will see open brood, you will see sealed brood. These are things you are looking for to know that your hive is healthy. This is just a feeder system that you will use for the winter and Brother Gordon will talk more about feeding. And this bottle is designed not for sugar water, but for honey. Feed your bees honey. Is that okay? Uh, one other thing, when, when you, how to determine that um, your bees need more work. So you need either to put more frames, or you need to put another super onto your hive. And I don't really recommend just putting a super. I believe that it's good to mix the frame. So you put some. So if you have one super that is sealed, you, put, you take out some half of it and you put it in another super and you in, intermix the frames, as I said before, in and out, in and out, most of the cases or in the center so that they can keep producing honey. And so I'm going, 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 going. So, so it's, we're dealing with white wax. It is, so when you open your hive, and on top here you notice that there is white wax, the wax is white, it means that the bees are doing well, right? And they need more frames to build and to continue working. Okay. So, signs of a failing queen. I don't know if you can see them clearly, but if you look here, you would see these uh, brood, sealed brood looking very abnormal. And she begins to produce more drones than worker bees. That means your queen is getting old. Okay? So when you see these things and you're wondering what are these, it's because your queen is getting old. And another sign is what you will see. See these here? Some, the workers sometimes do lay eggs. They, they can lay eggs too. Right? But you would notice, you would, you would know if there's a problem with your queen because the workers now will have a lot of, you would see a lot of eggs in one cell, about two, three, sometimes four, you know, eggs in one cell. You know your hive is in trouble when you see a number of eggs in one cell. If you notice the queen, she lays one egg to a cell, right? So, good. Just want to I'm fast forwarding now, time is going. Aha! Uh -huh. So sometimes, if a if a if a queen, if the queen you, you, while attending to the hive, if you may have crushed your queen or whatever, you would notice sometimes that the bees will start to make their own emergency cell, and it's not good to always destroy all of these cells. So what you do, you look for the most healthiest looking cell and you keep that one and you could sort of try to get rid of some of them. Sometimes what they recommend here is that you leave them, right? But this is what a healthy looking cell is, is here. You notice these are short, but this one here, a healthy looking cell, so queen cell. So sometimes the bees, they produce their own queen after a while and that is fine. So here we have chaos again, right? When you see it's like this, this bad, you know that the bees are planning to swarm. This is a single. So we talk a little about that new box. Uh, now, this is a very important part. I think you can read and get a lot of information 
But this year is dealing with diseases and many persons lose uh, courage to continue taking care of bees because as they start, they may have some unfortunate circumstances and um, so problems and diseases. An unexpected cold night in the spring can result in some chilling of the brood at the periphery of the cluster. You may see pulled out you may see pulled out pupa on the, on the landing board next morning. You do not need to be concerned. Once you know it was a cold night, you may see this, some bees that died. And that is, okay, that's not a problem. But this is a problem. UFB, European Fowl Brood, it's a killer. It's a killer. If the brood is spotty, and you got to look for signs of brood disease, you have chalk brood, white and tan mummies, you, you have the EFB, twisted white and yellow larva. All of these are diseases. The EFB is a common bacterial disease, especially in stressed colonies in the spring. UFB used to just go away before, but because of the bees, a weaker strain of bees, that is not happening anymore with European fowl brood. Then you have the chalk brood. This too creates a lot of problems. And so the bees will bring at the landing board all these little pupas and so forth, they are really dead because of this chalkboard disease, right? Um, so it's a fungus, it's a fungal disease, not healthy at all. And uh, let me just backtrack there. What is interesting for chalkboard is that there is no treatment for chalkboard. And if it doesn't spontaneously disappear, the best advice is to requeen your hive. Aha. Uh -huh. The American uh, fowl brew, the most serious disease, this one is bad. Uh, it's caused by a mite. And um, mites are some things that are not easy. So that is what I was saying when you're dealing with mites. You, have, you don't need that wire meshing at the bottom there and so forth. You're only encouraging mites and different creatures to attack your, your bees. Right. So although AFB, the American fowl brood, is now uncommon in professional apiaries, it is currently resurging in some urban areas that have a lot of hobby beekeepers who don't recognize this serious problem because it spreads, right? Because sometimes the mite, you see the thorax of the bees right at the back of its head, where the thorax is joining the head. The mites normally love to lodge themselves there. So, and they can shift around from bees to bees. They can destroy colonies. American fowl brood is nothing to mess with. Ask for help if you suspect it. Right? So it produces a salt and pepper brood pattern with some cells having sunken perforated cappings. It generally has a strong, distinct, unpleasant odor. It smells stink, actually, pungent odor. Right? Uh, between a gym socks and a dead rotten bees. Ah, uh, okay. Move on. Uh huh. So here we have. This is another way. Fall brood, well, American fall brood. When you see your larva is rot, rotting in your in the cell, and so forth. Um, these guys here, boy, this these guys here can really destroy your hive. 
and they and they look for the weak hives to attack them this <laughs> is wax worms and they are they are <laughs> it's really a wax moth that lays her eggs and this is just the developmental stage and then it turns into to, of course the wax moth again right as it goes through this metamorphosis stages different stages so uh, metamorphic stages so these guys are really terrible if you have a strong hive they will deal with them but if you have a weak hive you need as you go from time to time and you discover them you have to kill them you have to get rid of them otherwise they will destroy your hive in a short space of time what they do they get in between your frames and they begin to web their silk and what have you and the bees cannot work properly they get trapped in them these guys are bad news and it starts with the wax mat getting into your hive once a wax mat is in there once you see a wax mat it's a little moth once you see a little moth inside your hive kill it it's not a butterfly it's it's going to destroy your hive and this again is a mite that is they said it has been classified now as a fungus and it destroys your your hive as well so there are treatments for all of these and um what you have to do once you discover them you get to the uh necessary authorities that deals with um agriculture and beekeeping and those things and they should be able to help you people from the beekeeping as beekeepers association can get help for for you um so this is just how basically it looks and you can tell that something is wrong with your hive and the end is there any questions no questions everybody's fine yes okay so you can buy them or you can rear them yourself but when you are a novice beekeeper it's best to just buy your queens i don't you know and 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 work your way up there are courses to learn how to rear them properly uh, you that would be the best thing to do because it's always best to rear your own queen so you know exactly what you are getting you know exactly what you are getting yeah uh, yes so we hear all over the news Mm -hmm. why the bees are disappearing okay so remember we talk about food it's very important when you check your hive to make sure they have enough honey or whatever and if they don't have enough feed them unfortunately sometimes they go foraging in places where they have chemicals and they bring the chemicals into the hive and so forth destroys your bees chemicals is the number one cause for that as far as i know and with the with the with the with the with the you know with the genetically modified the gmos that is also creating a lot of problems as well right so is it a reality i i believe so i believe in certain places here yeah, the, the the population is on the decline but um bees there they, they they so more forested areas is more the safest places for rearing bees and the more forested areas the honey that comes from the more forested areas are more me medicinal and is the healthier brand of honey right the, the yeah the, the 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 honey that comes from the more forested areas because we know a lot of our medicines are in we get them from plants right yeah okay yeah is there anything else uh huh
Yeah, uh, okay, okay, I, w- I wouldn't add to what you said. No, no, I haven't, I haven't really spent any time looking into it. I've read it, I've heard it, I've heard that there is an alarm that this is happening. I did not take the time to get into it. But what I do know is that farmers who use chemicals and so forth, a lot of them, after the spring and the bees go and collect pollen or nectar, they die. But, yeah. Yes, I, I understand. But, but, but so, so if, if they are spraying it in the atmosphere and, and stuff, it's obvious they, they will kill the bees that way too. Gordon is going to take care of that now. So, so thank you so much. Okay. It all has to do with the way the bees work, right? So when you intermix the frames, they tend to work better that way. And they are going to build the combs that way. It, it's just something that has been observed. And when you set the frames that way in between, and sometimes more to the center, they, 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 they build the frames faster, the cells faster, and continue storing honey. That's basically what it is for. Yeah. Yes, Sister Sandra. Um, I heard on the radio about aggressive bees that come into the country and they attack our bee hives. Okay, so there are rubber bees, yes. There are bees that go into your hives and take your honey and stuff. Um, there, are those, there are those things. So that, and, and rubber bees can only come into your hive and do that if the hive is weak. If you have a strong hive, rubber bees can't, don't stand a chance. So if you have a weak hive, that is why, and I think I mentioned it earlier, if you have a weak hive, this is your, your bottom board, you have to block most of the entrance. And I guess for the winter too, blocking most of the entrance is important. Yes. Any more questions? Okay, great. Thank you all. You all have been a good audience. I hand over to to God. Okay. So um, I'm not exactly a professional beekeeper or anything, but I do hobby beekeep. And um, there's a couple of things that I wanted to mention that I've learned from the first couple of years of beekeeping. And uh, part of uh, and the subject that. that uh, Brother Charles was talking about was is winter beekeeping because he said, he, like he says, he doesn't have the same experience in that because he was doing it down in Trinidad. Uh, one thing, one thing I wanted to mention is is that uh, I'm just learning, so I'm going to give you a couple of resources. Uh, YouTube's a great resource, and there's a man named Michael Palmer, and he lives. Although he lives in the United States, he lives directly across from us. He's very close to actually Montreal, and he's on the Champlain River. So geographically, he's very, he has the same temperature as us. And um, he's been doing it, and he followed, um, he followed all the old beekeepers, uh, and they had all their practices, and then he's learned what is sustainable. Because essentially when Michael was getting into this, there was no such thing as varroa mite. And there was none of these diseases that we have to deal with nowadays, or GMO. GMO food wasn't even... So he's, he, has, he has to deal with these things. And so one of the things... Uh, so I recommend him if you're interested in getting into beekeeping as a profession. And then there's another gentleman that's, uh, that's from the southern states, um, and his name is Fat Bee Man. And he's a big fella, and uh, yeah, that's his YouTube channel name. And is Fat Bee Man, Fat Bee Man, and uh, he has some organic approaches on on uh, uh, on on beekeeping. But um, one of the ma- uh, on the subject of on the subject of winter beekeeping, um, one thing Michael Pal- uh, Palmer points out is is that. See, in the southern states, they get away with uh, one, one deep. 
and they they can overwinter with one deep. But in in Canada and and some in some places in between they do double deep. So Michael Palmer does two double deeps in a super, and that's what he overwinters in. And his bees have to be at least 150 pounds. If his if, if his bees are not 150 pounds, he does feed them. And uh, if he was to feed all his bees um, without he feeds them sugar. Now, I know that uh, Brother Charles doesn't agree with that, but there's one thing about beekeeping is there's a, um, there's a million beekeepers out there, and everybody has a different opinion on how you should do it. So I'm trying to, fi- I'm trying to figure that out. If the bees are going to starve, um, because they're not, and they're not going to make it through the winter, and you should find out in, in August, in, in, like soon, if your bees aren't bulking up <clears throat> right now, um, you need to feed them because they're not, they're not going to make it through. Now, um, he talks about feeding them organic honey. And uh, if you had to feed your bees 100 pounds of organic honey, you might as well just kill the hive off because, uh, because 100 pounds of organic honey is worth more than the bees. So he feeds sugar. He's a, he's a commercial beekeeper. And he doesn't, he, he can't, he can't afford to, feed a hundred pounds of of organic honey to his bees. The other trouble is is that when you feed honey to bees from another colony, you have the potential of introducing another disease because of honey. Um, the one thing I wanted to mention is, is um, um, this this screen bottom board uh, slides in the bottom here usually right here um, and some of them, some of them. The, the reason for this screen is is uh, to allow the uh, the insects to fall through and not be able to come back up. They have to crawl through. So that's part of that, I, um, and and so now, and that's part of that. And the other thing I, I love what Charles mentioned about uh, about introducing frames. So what bees love to do, and I think I'm just trying to because I'm thinking of things that he mentioned. Bees jump. The middle part of their hive is where they, where they, 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 that's where they focus all their energy. And they want to put brood in there. And you throw this, this is a plastic frame, and, um, and if you throw this plastic frame and it's covered with wax in the middle of that, do you know what they want to do? I, I, I've, see, uh, uh, I've seen personally that when you do that, and this hive is strong, in a day, you can see how much they've they've done in just in one day, and you, you know how much the, you've seen how much wax uh, uh, one honeybee takes uh, to do to produce. They're they're like this is this is our place. This is where this is where we're making eggs here, and and this is where and this is where the queen's laying. You throw a, you throw a frame in there, and they jump on it, and they want to and they start laying eggs even as the cells are being developed. And so he's absolutely right that that is a, a fantastic place when you're building a, uh, a hive. One other thing I'd like to mention is, is that I like to purchase, so I'm going to give an example here. Oh, that's uh, something that was in there. Um, a nuke is essentially a half of a, a, half of a, half of a hive, right? And... I don't like buying nukes because they're 180 bucks and and I, I'm cheap. <laughs> just to just to put it simply, um, you can buy an entire hive for 300 bucks. So 180 dollars for for four frames. It has a queen on it. Has established brood. Now you have to build this thing up, and that's what, why I'm here. Build this thing up before winter, and if you have a hard winter it's highly likely that you'll lose it, especially if you're not feeding it, right? So I like to buy a full production hive. You can buy a full deep, which is something, what, 250 And that would have all bees down here and, and drawn out comb and, and a full thing. And then for the extra $50, you get a full load of honey. So I personally would rather buy a full load of honey with all the frames and all the stuff that ha- is included in it 
That's why I like buying it. It's a full hive, and you even get a lid. I, when I purchased mine, Graham was like, hey, look at that lid you got. It's, uh, it's one of those vented top covers. And he, he, he was like, well, that's fantastic. I didn't have to buy any of that. So if I, if I was to recommend to you what you could do as a first-time beekeeper is to buy a full production hive to overwinter. Now, the, the, what is the biggest killer for bees in the winter? Moisture. Moisture. See, the trouble with uh, bees going through the winter is, is um, they have the ability to create their own heat. But, and they can stand a lot of cold, but they're all breathing. Ever been in a barn full of cows? You ever touch the wall? It's covered in water, right? It, the, the bees have to breathe. So when you put this thing in here, and this is, uh, this is Michael Palmer, he puts, because mice have the tendency to want to get in here, he puts a screen, the entire perimeter, and he, he just bends it in. It's hardware cloth. It's quarter-inch hardware cloth, and it keeps the mice out, right? And that same top board that uh, Charles had on his thing, is he, he, he takes the top board, and he flips it over, and there's a little notch in the top, and there's, there's, it's basically summer-winter mode. And um, it's for two different purposes, but um, basically in the wintertime, that's their... That's their ec potential escape hatch because you don't want them going out there in the, in the, in the winter time. And it's also for, for the air to come out because the amount, this, this hive would be happier if there was constant supply of air. And the biggest trouble I've had because of hail and frost and stuff uh, is, is ice getting in here, right? Now, it's not from normal snow, but it's from freezing rain freezing rain blocking this up and I'll go in there and I'll and I'll bust this I'll bust the ice out so that it's not completely plugged so that the air is can able to continue to circulate and the other thing that uh, Michael does is he, uh, he he covers and there's it's kind of like a school of thought and I'll let you decide what you want to do they cover them with tar paper that's a commercial standard they literally wrap it around they staple it on and they fold the top on top they take uh, a piece of uh, ISO, stick it on top of that, put the top board on, and ratchet strap it or tie it closed. And that's how they, and then they tear a hole for the vent, and then they make sure that paper isn't down here. Uh, and, and that's it. That's the extent. It's, it's not about keeping your bees warm. Bees can keep themselves warm. They're, uh, they're essentially a... Uh, um, um, they're, they're, they keep the queen warm. And the biggest problem I've had, and I've lost, I, I love beekeeping, and I've lost stuff, and, and um, uh, beehives. And I've, ha I've had bees on really tough years. I go to a, somebody who said, well, yeah, we lost professional beekeepers. Uh, my wife Pam has a friend, uh, uh, they're, they're the Stemlers, and, and their daughter keeps a thousand bees, right? Uh, beehives, pr full production. And that year that we lost our bees, they lost uh, 25%, but at least 25%. And what we have to do here was, uh, like, we have to manage our loss and be able to build. And again, this is Michael Palmer explains this about sustainability. And uh, it's, it's way outside of the, this talk because it's... it's it's, um, it's about two or three hours, but it's about building your knowledge on that. So that's, that's basically what it, what it entails is that you, over, um, when you're overwintering, you have to start thinking in the spring about overwintering your bees because it starts, with, it starts by managing all the way through. And like I said, Michael Palmer has an excellent talk on it, and uh, he does a great job. Um, the other thing is, is, um, oh, uh, is varroa mites. Varroa mites weren't here. I can't remember the year they came here. But varroa mites um, don't kill bees. There's two viruses they carry, and one is actually benign and doesn't, or it doesn't actually do anything to the bees, but the other one's killer. So you can have varroa mites in your hive, and I think it was Africa that took an approach where we, they said they're not going to treat their hives, and they won. 
they don't treat their hives for anything because the strongest hives survived and, and there, is, there is no problem with feral mites. But because the rest of society here, like he, uh, Charles was saying that a bee can fly um, six kilometers, well, if there's another beehive within your six kilometers, you can get varroa mites from somebody else's from other somebody else's hive. So, varroa mites is a serious issue uh, for overwintering. Because and so you have to manage your varroa mites. And basically, um, I'm not I'm not big on chemicals either. But there's a product that is called formic acid, and I believe. That product is created naturally in, in ants, but I'm not sure if they actually get it directly from it. It's formic acid, I believe ants already produce formic acid. And you basically put a strip on this to reduce, and you have to test to see your, your varroa mites and all that stuff. But that's the second worst uh, problem uh, with bees. And I didn't have varroa mites for years. I actually bought a production hive I put it in my colony and I didn't quarantine it and I found varroa mites and it just went into everything because that's just the reality, right? Um, so varroa mites is something that has to be managed in this, in this country, but it isn't that difficult because formic acid isn't a, a, a strong chemical and it, isn't a, um, and it isn't a particular, there's other things you can use, but I, I'm, I'm not talking about that. I'm not a professional. And... Um, Oh, and the fat bee man likes to use, what is it, eucalyptus oil? He uses a smoker and he uses eucalyptus oil and he smokes it inside the hive and I can't say whether or not it works. Um, so um, one of the, uh, the other things that I want, uh, to, wanted to mention is um, oh, about feeding. If your hive is not up to weight, you have to feed it. And you can feed honey. But what I do is I feed sugar. Bees are, bees are fructose factories. That's what they do. Now, I'm not saying, I know I, I've read the book on bee gut flora and stuff like that, but these, the bees are bee, they're sugar-making factories. And so if your bees are not going to make it through the winter and they're going to starve to death, picturing starving to death, right? So your option is, is you can feed honey, but if you get it into any kind of commercial se uh, setting, they all feed sugar. And I'm not saying that you should ever feed sugar to a beehive and then, and then, and then give somebody some honey from it. I'm not saying that you should do that. But if your, bee, if your bees are going to starve to death, feed them. Feed them. And, it, and you have to know ahead of time, because if you're feeding them sugar, you have to know in, depending on the year, because they have, to, they have to process it. It has to be in the comb, ready for them to use over winter. Now, I have seen some other products on the market. Uh, her name is Debbie, Debbie's Bees. Um, she actually takes a very, very organic approach on her bees. Um, she, doesn't, she is never treated for anything. I believe that she probably has very strong genetics. She got them from her... She's... she's She's older now, but uh, she's got very strong genetics, and she's uh, kind of down near Carlton Place. I seen her do a talk in, uh, I think it was Smith Falls. Um, but she's actually getting out of it, unfortunately, But because um, um, she, she's getting old. Um, and genetics has a lot to do with, it, to do with that. Like, we, if you take an Italian bee, or you take a... I mean, there's some bees that you can get. You can get from South Carolina. They don't know how to overwinter. They've never, they, they, you know, it's not, it's not something they they they're they're, they're used to doing. And uh, and uh, I've seen people get bees from Hawaii because they want to get early jumps on the season. And that is that's a really, you know, think interesting thing to do. But they don't seem to do well in our environment. So. Bees that are raised in this area are do have the advantage. You don't have to get something from South Carolina, or we we actually can't even get those things. We, I think we can get them from Hawaii because it's not a part of the 52 states. We actually have a 
Um, we, you can't cross the border with bees in, in between the United States and Canada. I don't know why, because we have we all have the same diseases, but they we can't. There's no border border crossing for bees. Um, you want you can speak to that a little bit. Yes. 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 So you have to follow the act and regulations are important. Yes. And because of that, that part of what related to what Gord just said, um, you can't just buy bees from anybody. Well, you can, and people will sell you bees, but in order to sell bees legally, you have to have your hives. Yes, yes, and that's, and that's absolutely true. That's right. I. I Yes, and and uh, and I and I and I did actually buy a colony. Actually, uh, I uh, I recommend uh, as uh, as much as I uh, I recommend uh, speaking to Graham specifically about a person we know um, for buying bees. He's uh, he's a professional beekeeper, and he um, and and he and he sells full hives. So if you're interested in doing that. I would recommend doing that as opposed to buying a nuke because it takes heroic efforts for those bees to make it through. And, and don't be surprised if you try to do the $180 inexpensive cardboard box with four frames in it, it's fail. It's a high, I'm cheap, so I know I would much rather buy a bottom board, two boxes, frames, double high, a lid, it's a complete package. I think that you. I think that cost you two hundred bucks, anyways, for a complete package. I bought. I got an entire package for two hundred and ninety dollars this spring. Well, are, are you talking like a double uh, of uh, just wood, or are you talking beehive? A strong, powerful beehive. For everything. Okay, so my question is: Is just the wood? If you're to buy the wood, so one hundred and fifty dollars of that is material, anyway. So you're getting you're getting this whole package. It's actually less money because you're, you're getting a nuke plus all the material. So that's why I recommend purchasing that way. And as for overwintering, um, um, yeah, I think that moisture is the biggest one and airflow essentially is the biggest one and insulation. Is there any questions? Yes. Oh, yeah, so there, there's, a, there's a couple of schools of thought on that. Um, so, uh, one person recommends that you take a, uh, an extra super, which Charles was talking about, which is only half the size here. You put that on top, and you put, uh, this is actually Debbie's Bees, you put uh, hardware cloth in there, and then you put cedar shavings in the top. And the cedar shavings absorb the moisture. Some people use sugar on the top, because sugar, just like when you put sugar in your, up in your cupboard, what happens? It soaks all the moisture up. So some people use sugar. Um, some people use wood shavings, um, and dried wood shavings. Oh, and also, yes, and my, thank, thank you. My wife is informing me. See how this is, already, this, this is actually naturally tilting? Well, when you tilt your hive just slightly forward here, the reason for it is, is that the moisture that's on the lid, because moisture rises, will go to the front of the hive and then run down the side. If, if it's sitting flat, the moisture will pool right here and drop right on, right on the bees. And, and that's, and moisture kills. Like, they literally die from moisture. Like, they get, they, they literally get wet and they die. That's, Yeah. Carves it with about an inch of uh, an inch and a half or two inches of sugar. Yes. And yeah. another box which has got a, a hole with it fills that entirely with wood shavings. So and the more the merrier, and I couldn't agree more. And and so I've lost some to some to starvation from learning because my 
my uh, my goal is production. I want to I wanted to get more and more and more. I wanted to, I wanted I wanted a hobby. I wanted to I wanted another hobby. And the trouble is is that um, and the other thing I'm guilty of is um, is I'm guilty of um, not wanting to kill the queen. I'll have my I'll have my queens here, and I'll be like, this hive isn't producing enough, and I'm trying to fill it, feed it as much as I can, and I'm like, well, maybe it'll make it through, right? And we're I'm guilty of that, right? And uh, and this little hive, and it's a little bit of honey, and I'll try feeding it even some honey, like he said, because you can't add, introduce uh, sugar, um, they they just can't uh, they can't work with it. They have to break it down, and so um, I tried even feeding them honey. Because I just don't want to kill that queen because I want her for next year. You have to, you have to have an approach if you're serious about um, maximizing production. You have to take that queen. Uh, somebody calls uh, his all of his queens Martha, so that when he kills the Mar- queen Martha, there's another queen named Martha that can re- replace her, right? So if you name your queens, call them all Martha or whichever name you choose, and and. Take that that full that all that work that was developed all summer long that she did and put it in another hive, so that that hive has a better chance of making it through. And I, you know, somebody said you should always let somebody else weed your radishes. You know, Ivan and Phyllis here. Um, you, it's almost like somebody else needs to take care of Martha for me because I, I'm guilty of that same issue. Uh, yes, yeah, Ed. Yeah. Can you not build a little, do you lift over top of that? You absolutely, you, you absolutely can. Uh, yeah, he was saying, Ed saying that about the freezing rain. See, we get, for some reason, in December, we get a, a shot of freezing rain, and it'll just plug this full. And then a couple of times in the winter, same thing, you, it'll just plug it full. And he's saying you could put a shelf over that, and I've seen them put them out here. Yeah, yeah. And and he's absolutely right. He, that that absolutely could be done. Um, but the the key here is is that the air coming in is allowed to escape to uh, to carry the moisture with it. <clears throat> Any other questions? You? You have a question? I thought you had a hand. Thank you. Okay, so uh, the best time to go in uh, to go into your hive is is that you sometimes you get a some people knock on their beehives. I'm not saying you should or shouldn't do that. Uh, some people say you shouldn't, um, but you can do you can actually stick your ear on the side of the hive, and you can listen in the middle of the winter and see how your hive is doing. If it's humming along there, you can t- you know they're they're alive, right? Um, and sometimes it does take a, and that's all it takes, and they'll the, you you'll hear them. Um, you should never go and and she's right you should never go into your hives in the dead of winter but there's a warm spell uh, in early spring Um, these bees have been holding their bathroom break for all all winter long and they they need to do a cleansing flight they have to go to the bathroom they've been holding it for a long time and so in early spring um, just be if you're planning on being near your beehives, just, just wear a hat. That's all I gotta say, because they're gonna go. They go to the bathroom everywhere, and they want a little bit of water. So it's good that it's warming up because it's gonna melt the snow, and they'll look for look for a drink. And yes, and they'll pull all the dead because there's going to this hive is going to is going to manage itself. They they've been doing it forever, and uh, and they're gonna continue to try to manage it in the same way. And they'll, the hive will slowly break down and get smaller and smaller. And the one thing that North Americans and like Canadians and like the, our bees explode. Like it, it, they, like the people in the South don't have this, don't experience the same thing that we do. And we have things like uh, uh, our first, uh, our first pollen is uh, is the the red maples, right? And our bees explode. And they go from from nothing to fully development in just a short period of time, and that is a really good time to check on swarm preparation, because if you don't, if they don't have enough room, because uh, I think uh, nectar is 80 percent 
they got to get it down to, they got to get the percentage of fluid down. So they got to stuff it somewhere. So in these little combs here, um, because they want to they fill up their hive, these little combs here are going to be, they, they're going to fill these up with nectar and then try to turn them into honey. But all that nectar, it's just like uh, Ivan was talking about maple syrup, is they're going to, they're going to evaporate it and bring it down till it's in make it's until they make it into honey and that that process requires a lot of space so you have to give your bees a lot of space and there's uh there's a couple of techniques that they use the, in the spring they call it reversal and they literally take the bottom hive and they take it off and they put the top hive down and then they put the the the, the one on top and that's called reversing and that'll help against swarm preparations. And then the other thing is, um, just trying to think, um, oh, um, giving them more space, giving them that super early. Some people say, I don't like the taste of certain pollens and, and certain nectars. If you give the, the hive the space, then it'll also prevent swarm, uh, swarm preparation. Any other questions? I have seen uh, these kind of space blanket stuffs. So I'm not. I've I've seen them. It basically looks like what you hot, wrap your hot water heater in, um, and they wrap them. I can't tell you if it works good or if it works bad. Um, but uh, that was that was what I was just going to say. Is, is that yes, um, the the space blanket thing. Uh, what kills bees is moisture, and I can't tell you if that would make it bad or better. Perhaps. One, one thing to note that, that uh, it was told to me by uh, the beekeeper that uh, Gord's alluded to is that you, there is compensation available from the government of Canada from the, from the farming association if you're yes. taking bees off, but they require you to wrap the bees in the way in which Gord described with the black Paper. Yes. Got a very specific format to keep that graphic. And um, the thing that was interesting is because I asked him about that experience that I didn't have a dial. And uh, he explained the process and he said, and I don't do it because I don't think it works very well. <laughs> so, yes. So my, my point being is, is that um, even amongst what the government recommends, some of the commercial beekeepers disagree with it. So yes. So there's, there are, there's many things that, that people do. And he's a successful beekeeper, and he, did, he, he, would rather not, he would rather take his losses doing it the way he found works than follow what the government recommends in order to get compensation. So it's interesting. Well, and, and do, you, do, you, do, you, do you know what happened to the softwood industry here? The softwood industry was taking money from the government, and, and, and the United States said, well, hey, free trade. And uh, now the softwood industry has collapsed in Canada, right? So what, what are we doing here? We're saying, um, give us some money because we lost some bees. And what can, uh, what can the state say? Hey, uh, you're, you're, uh, you're, you're funding, you're funding uh, food production and so on and so forth. And that's uh, against the free trade agreement. So we have to be careful with what we do. And uh, taking money from the government um, comes with strings, and and the softwood industry is a prime example of those strings. So um, it's uh, that's where I'm going to leave that at. That you can stay out of politics. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, I think that. Oh, go ahead. Well, so Charles hit on that subject very well. If, you, if this hive is fully developed and doing strong, um, sometimes you'll have, I don't like aggressive bees, so I actually, if I have a queen that's aggressive, I immediately, um, I squish her because I have children. I squish her and I, I let, I take a hive from a, I take eggs, or, uh, eggs from another hive, or I'll, I'll, I'll requeen from another hive, and that hive is no longer uh, what I want in my thing. So that aggressive hive, will have on a weak hive the potential to rob. But um, Charles alluded to it also with the, uh, with the reducers, entrance reducers, because um, 
it doesn't take very many bees to on a weak hive to protect it. So that's more about management. Um, a completely weak hive that has a wide open gate, yes, will will have a propensity to robbing, uh, no matter what. Okay, I think uh, I think that's it. Is there no more questions, Graham. Okay, so so if I have a hive and I, I like what the queen, but she's gotten too old, you can go in and you can pinch the queen, and they'll literally just take eggs, right? And they'll literally just take eggs, and um, and they'll start making their own they'll start making their own queen, and you'll see all kinds of them. And what I like to do is when I when I like my queen and I want to requeen another hive, I'll go in and I'll take one out and I say, well, this one's got two queens, and this one this one's got two cells, some queen cells, and I go, I don't really like that queen. Boop, squish, done. I I don't I don't. Um, it it is it is it's not in my caliber to to do the little scooping thing and and making my own queens. I, I I'm not there yet. Um, because I am again a, a beginning beekeeper, um, but that is one way of doing it. And um, and so I have a pre I, so if I if I do this, I'll sometimes even start nukes in the spring from all the from my favorite queens, and then I'll requeen the ones that I don't like at the same time. Go ahead, Pam. Oh yes, Pam, Pam's always reminding me about all these important things. So if you take this out of the hive like this, and let's say this has a number one on this side, you can mark all your sides, and you go like this, you put it back in, they don't like that. It's, I don't know, it's like you, you, you just rewound their clock or something, they don't like that. I don't know why, but uh, they, uh, they, they'll, they'll do things in there, and they just don't like you reversing their frames. So just keep them, just don't do that. I, do, I can't tell you exactly why, but I know they don't like it. <laughs> Anything else? That's right. Well, they, they, have, they have a system in which they, they build their hives, and, uh, but I can't remember why. Yep. Killer, yes, uh, I, yes, yes. I, I, I'm, I, I call it because you know, like I, uh, yeah, I, I, I didn't want to say massacre. I, I squish her. <laughs> I squish my queen, uh, and I have done it. Um, when, uh, whenever you're, if your bee, if your hive's not producing well, like I know that there's a lady named Debbie, and she's a very kind lady. She actually does not squish her queens. She'll let them. She'll let them fade down, and then they'll automatically requeen, and she lets them do it themselves. And she doesn't care about the downtime because you'll probably lose about a year because of how large her, her apiary is. She can afford to do that, and, and she's not trying to get rich, and she just loves doing it. So um, that's why she does it that way. But I, uh, the reason why they, do, they all do the queen squish thing after two years and, or three, depending on who you talk to, is, is production. Uh, it's the same reason why chicken eggs are, they're, they're only good for two years. A egg layers are apparently, they're only good for two or three years, and then they're not good for laying anymore, right? It's the same thing. So it's about production. Any other questions? It's not a question, it's a suggestion. Okay. Could it be that when you burn that, mm -hmm. that they have their own direction finder, just like the bird? I, I, I. I would. I. I remember. I used to know why, but I can't remember why. But it probably does have something to do with that, and it has something to do with the way they, the way they lay the eggs and their patterns and all that stuff. Oh, again, I. I. I can't remember why, but I know it's not good. It's the only thing I could say. <laughs> Is that it? All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay. Yeah, so um, you see those orange ratchet straps out there, the, the ones you can get at the hardware store? You literally take a strap and you write it underneath here.
and you go right over top. The other thing I wanted to say is, is that, you know, um, Charles, um, um, what's Peterson? I, I can't, I'm, his first name's last name. Anyways, um, he has he has a mentor mentoring him, and he's in the area, and there's a whole lot you can learn from going over there. Uh, does everybody know who Peterson is? Okay, well, I, I, I highly suggest you go over there because he's connected probably with a bee club, and also he wants to do this as a business from home. So I would love to do this, but it's kind of like the shoemaker's son goes without shoes. I haven't had the time to put, it, put into it the way somebody who's willing to go at it full time. Um, Yes, yes, yes. And say, for example, it's Gord, and his wife is washing his clothes. Yes, yeah, yes. If his wife does not get stung by a bee at least once a year, she will develop an allergy to the bee pollen. Yes. So um, it's an interesting thing that, that the person that has the handling the clothes needs to get stung periodically. If, if you're in a beekeeper family, absolutely. Children, man, woman, and child has to be okay with being stung at least once a year. Beca or the husband, if let's say it's the husband, the husband has to wash all of his clothes when he's dealing with the bees out, outside the... He can't wash them in the same washing machine because you're being exposed to the, 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 ven the venom on your clothes and being, and from being stung and, and such. And... Because you're, they're being, they're being exposed to it, so um, that is one option to to help it. But a, the beekeeper, a beekeeper's ha uh, family, is a hundred times more likely to be allergic to develop an allergy than it is the general public. And so it has to be, it has to be a family thing. Um, if you're not getting stung very, very often, it, it helps. And but I do recommend that you wash your clothing in another, somewhere else, other than in the family washing machine. Do you understand the keeping it separate? And the reason being is that you're you're exposing your whole family to the. Um, I can't think of the name of it. It's it's the anti venom, and I can't think of. Uh, Anyways, you're exposing that they're not, they're, they're being exposed to the venom, but they're not getting stung. So when you're getting stung, it doesn't matter because you're getting stung. But if you're not getting stung, then you're... <laughs> that was a big airplane. And that was another airplane. <laughs> Anyways, if you're um, if you're uh, if you're not getting stung and you're exposed to it, that's what makes you more likely to be allergic. Any other questions? Yes. Yes, uh, I see. I see, I see that. That's common over in Europe. Yes, I couldn't agree more. Um, they. It's kind of like they're using the heat from all of their hives because actually one of the one another problem with overwintering is is that when you heat the hive up, the sun will heat the hive up, and the bees like that. But it goes from plus plus 10 in the hive and they're moving all around. They don't want to go outside because it's not actually plus 10. And they're all active in there. And then the temperature goes down to minus 30 like that because the sun goes down. Well, they're not clustered the way they're supposed to. And so the, the huge fluctuation can cause death. And you are right. Um, and that's why some people don't use the tar paper and some people use it. Like Marco Palmer is very successful with using it. And he has a production. He has he has over a thousand hives, and he 
And, and uh, no, he does, yeah. He, he uses the tar paper for the fact of the, the thermal mass, but he believes that the, um, the, the heat in the hive is slower to cool off. Yes, Ed. Um, it, it is, I, I can't tell you because I've never tried it, but I've seen lots about it, and there's lots on YouTube. <laughs> Yes. MS. Like MS for treating things like uh, arthritis, actually intentionally singing to, uh, to help conditions. So it's interesting. Yes. As well, yes. Part of research which is starting particularly on her. Go ahead there, Will. That's exactly the point I was going to make. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Yes, and uh, I can't say I'm not experimenting with that. I do. I, 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 I like the research on it, but uh, I can't comment on it per se. <laughs> Fair enough. I think we're done here now. Yes.